is everyone? We go live there in 15 minutes and no one's here. Radio broadcasting is unraveling my last nerve. Mr. Robson, I really hate to tell you this, but the pianist who was supposed to come play on our live show today has eaten some mushrooms and is ill. Uh, but don't worry about it. I happen to be a wonderful musician and I'm going to handle the whole thing. Just don't worry your pretty little head about it. Oh, uh, we'll find a way to muddle through this one way or another. Call yourself Mr. Robson. I have everything under control. The talent will be ready to go. Why don't you have a nice cigarette to calm your nerves? I think there's a pack of Lucky Strike in the coffee room. Good idea. Never a breath of pop with a Lucky. Columbia Workshop, under the direction of Bill Robson, presents Alice in Wonderland. But first, a word from our sponsor. I'm sure most of you are quite busy these days with last minute shopping and getting the house in order for the holidays, a time of year when you need plenty of Lux Flakes. In fact, there's a most unusual holiday use for Lux Flakes on your Christmas tree. Just add two cups of lukewarm water to a large box of Lux Flakes. Whip with an egg beater until it's consistency of thick whipped cream. Then spread the mixture on the tree branches with your fingertips. It dries in about an hour. And it lasts as long as the tree. When it's dry, add your lights and ornaments as usual. You can use fewer ornaments though, because Lux Christmas snow is a decoration in itself and so inexpensive. Lux Flakes is another fine product of Lever Brothers. Alice in Wonderland, a fairy story of the 19th century, a bit of a gossamer flimsy, a fantasy for children. Alice, a fairy story peopled with human beings, animals that talk like men. Do they mirror men who act like animals? I do not know. I merely wrote a simple story about a little girl for a little girl. Half of the world has, for 72 years, called it childish nonsense, the other half significant social satire. To me, it has always been simply Alice's Adventures in Wonderland. Alice in Wonderland. Oh, Alice did fidget so. I beg your pardon, sister, but it is so very dull today. Isn't it tea time yet? Not quite. We'll go in and when I finish this chapter on me. Oh, I don't you go pick some daisies? Oh, it's so dreadfully hard to pick daisies. <laughs> sister, look down there in the grass, a white rabbit. Hmm. Oh, oh dear, oh dear, I shall be late. Sister, did you hear that? Hear what? The rabbit, he looked at his watch and then he spoke. Oh, that's your imagination. I'm going to follow him and see where he goes. Alice, Alice, come back here. Alice, where are you going? I, I've got to see the rabbit again, sister. Dear, he just popped into that hole under the hedge. There's such a very large rabbit hole. Perhaps, perhaps I could squeeze through. There, I can still see him. He's down at the end. Oh, I must hurry. I must. Oh, oh, I'm falling. I'm falling. Falling down what seems to be a very deep well. Either the well was very deep or she fell very slowly for she had plenty of time to look about her and notice that the sides of the well were filled with cupboards and bookshelves. After such a fall as this, I shall think nothing of tumbling downstairs. Why, I wouldn't even say anything about it, even if I fell off the 
on top of a house. Which is very likely true. Down, 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 Alice became very drowsy, and she had almost fallen asleep when... Oh! Gracious, I've landed! I ought to be hurt, but I don't seem to be. Now, where is the white rabbit? Oh, there he is! Oh, my ears and whiskers, how late it's getting! He's turned the corner of the passage, or I mustn't lose him! But when Alice turned the corner, the rabbit was no longer to be seen. She found herself in a long, low hall with doors all around it, all locked. In the middle was a little three-legged table of solid glass, but nothing on it but a tiny key. Alice tries the key in the various doors of the hall, but either the locks are too large or the key is too small. Now she sees a little door about 15 inches high. She tries the little golden key in the lock and it fits. Alice is opening the door. Now she is kneeling to look through the passage. It leads to a lovely garden, but she can't even get her head through the doorway. And even if my head would go through, it would be of very little use without my shoulders. Oh, how I wish I could shut up like a telescope. I think I could if I only knew how to begin. Alice is returning to the table now. She's looking for another key or perhaps a, a book of rules for shutting people up like telescopes. She doesn't find either, but there is a little bottle there. Which certainly wasn't here before. Around the neck of the bottle is a paper label with the words drink me beautifully printed on it in large letters. Drink me. Mm, no. I'll look first and see whether it's marked poison. But the bottle was not marked poison, so Alice ventured to taste it and finding it very nice. It has, in fact, a sort of mixed flavor of cherry tart custard, pineapple roast turkey, toffee, and hot buttered toast. She very soon finished it off. <sighs> oh, what a curious feeling. I must be shutting up like a telescope. She is shrinking. She is now only 10 inches high. She's about the size to go through the door into the lovely garden now. She's a little nervous though, afraid she might shrink too far. It might end, you know, in my going out altogether, like a candle. I wonder what I should be like then. Fortunately, nothing more happened. But alas, for poor Alice, she had left the little golden key on the table. And though she could see it quite plainly through the glass, she was now much too small to reach it. Soon, her eye fell on a little glass box that was lying under the table. She opened it and found in it a very small cake on which the words, eat me, were beautifully marked in currants. Well, if I eat it, and if it makes me grow larger, I can reach the key. And if it makes me grow smaller, I can creep under the door. So, either way, I'll get into the garden, and I don't care much which happens. Which way? Which way? She is holding her hand on the top of her head to feel which way she is growing. <laughs> oh, curious, so I'm curious, sir. She is so surprised, she quite forgets to speak good English. No, I'm opening out like the larger telescope that ever was. Goodbye, feet. Ouch! Her head strikes against the roof of the hall. She is now more than nine feet high. She takes up the little golden key and hurries off to the garden door. Poor Alice. It was as much as she could do, lying down on one side, to look into the garden with one eye. But to get through the little door was more hopeless than ever. She sat down and began to cry. Oh, oh you ought to be ashamed of yourself, a great big girl like you. She might well say this. To go on crying in this way. Stop this moment, I tell you. But she went on just the same, shedding gallons of tears until there was a large puddle all around her, about four inches deep and reaching halfway down the hall. She heard a little pattering of feet in the distance, and 
she hastily dried her eyes as the white rabbit returned. This time splendidly dressed with a pair of white kid gloves in one hand and a large fan in the other. He came trotting along in a great hurry, muttering to himself as he came. Oh, the Duchess! Oh, the Duchess! Oh, won't she be savage if I kept her waiting? If you please, sir! Oh, oh, my ears and whiskers! Stop! You've dropped your gloves and your fan! My ears and whiskers, oh! And the white rabbit was gone. Alice took up the fan and gloves, and as the hall was very hot, she started to fan herself. Gracious! I must be growing small again! I am! I'm only two feet high. I shall go out altogether. It must be the fan. Oh, that was a narrow escape. If I hadn't dropped that fan, it would have been the end of me. But now I'm small enough to get through the door. And Alice finds herself up to her chin in salt water, swimming around in the pool of tears she had wept when she was nine feet high. Oh, I wish I hadn't cried so much. I shall be punished for it now, I suppose, by being drowned in my own tears. That would be a queer thing, to be sure. However, everything is clear today. Oh, what a fearful racket! It must at least be a walrus or a hippopotamus. Oh no, I've forgotten how small I've grown. It's only a mouse. But it is bigger than I am. Oh, Mouse, do you know the way out of this pool? I'm very tired of swimming about here. Oh, Mouse! Perhaps it doesn't understand English. I did say it's a French mouse come up with William the Conqueror. Où est mon chat? First sentence in Alice's French book. Translation, where is my cat? The mouse doesn't like the reference in English or in French. Oh, I beg your pardon. I quite forgot you didn't like cats. Not like cats? Where would you like cats if you were me? Well, perhaps not, but I do wish I could show you our cat, Dinah. She's such a capital one for catching mice. Oh, I do beg your pardon. We won't talk about her anymore if you'd rather not. Me, really, indeed. As if I would talk on such a subject. Our family always hated cats. Nasty, low, vulgar things. Don't you let me ever hear the name again. I won't, indeed. I promise. Very well, then. Let us go to the shore, and I'll tell you my, my history, and you will understand why it is that I hate cats. It was high time to go, for the pool was getting quite crowded with the birds and animals that had all fallen into it. There was a duck, and a dodo, a lorry, and an eaglet, and several other curious creatures. Alice led the way, and the whole party swam ashore. They are indeed a queer-looking party as they assemble on the bank. The birds with draggled feathers, the animals with their fur clinging closely to them, and all dripping wet and cross and uncomfortable. The first question, of course, is how to get dry again, and an argument ensues which the dodo, who seems to be a person of some authority, finally ends. Quiet, all of you. If you really want to get dry, then the uh, best way is a caucus race. What is a caucus race? Why, the, the only way to explain it is, uh, uh, to do it. And, as you might like to try the thing yourself some winter day, I will tell you how the dodo managed it. First, it marked out a caucus race in sort of a circle. Though it said the exact shape didn't matter. And then, everybody was placed along the course, here and there. There was no one, two, three and away, but they began running when they liked. And left off when they liked. So that it was not easy to know when the race was over. However, when they had been running half an hour or so, the dodo suddenly called out, The race is over! Just 
a minute, just a minute, let me think. Everybody has one, and all must have prizes. Oh, prizes! But, but who is to give the prizes? Why, she, of course. Me? Yes, you. Prizes! 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 Alice had no idea what to do, and in despair she put her hand in her pocket and pulled out a box of candy. Lucky the salt water had not got into it. Mm. And handed them around as prizes. Mm. There were exactly one apiece all around. But she must have a prize herself, you know. Of course. What else have you got in your pocket, little girl? Um, uh, oh, only a thimble. Oh, 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 no. Hand it over here. There. Thank you. We beg your acceptance of this elegant thimble. Yay! 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 And now, while we eat our prizes... Well, I can't eat mine. It's a thimble. You're lucky. Oh, 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 oh my stupid... Uh, help, I'm choking. <laughs> here, here, you there. Pat his back, pat his back. Other side will make you grow shorter. 
One side of what? The other side of what? Of the mushroom! Now, how can you tell which are the two sides of the mushroom when it's perfectly round? Oh, maybe if I stretch my arms around as far as they can go and break off a bit of the edge with each hand, there! And now, which is which? I guess I'll try the right hand piece first. Oh, I'm getting smaller so quick my chin hit my foot. I have to eat some of the left hand piece right away. It is so hard to get my mouth open. There. Come, my head's free at last. As she grew larger, she saw, across the top of the mushroom, a little house about four feet high. I can never visit that lovely place if I grow to my full size, so I'd better stop here. She is nibbling a little on the right hand piece. Now a quick nibble on the left hand piece. She is now established at nine inches. As she approached the house, a fish dressed in a footman's livery came running out of the woods and rapped loudly at the door. It was opened by another footman in livery who was really a frog. Alice crept behind a bush to listen as the fish footman presented a great letter nearly as large as himself. For the Duchess, an invitation from the Queen to play croquette. Um, an invitation from the Duchess to play croquette. They both bowed, and the curls of their wigs got entangled together. Alice laughed so much at this that she had to run back into the woods for fear of their hearing her. And when she peeped out, the fish footman was gone and the frog footman was sitting on the ground near the door, staring stupidly into the sky. Alice went up to the door and knocked. <laughs> It is full of smoke. The Duchess is sitting on a stool nursing a baby. The cook is stirring a large cauldron of soup and she throws pepper into it by the shakerful. A large cat is lying on the hearth, grinning from ear to ear. He doesn't sneeze. Neither does the cook, but everyone else does. <laughs> Please, would you tell me why your cat grins like that? It's a Cheshire cat, and that's why. Pig. Were you speaking to me? No, I was speaking to this brat. Oh. Take that! And that! And that! Oh, be careful! What are you throwing the pots and pans at the baby for? That happens every afternoon at four o'clock. Oh, please, mind what you're throwing, cook. Be careful. Don't! Ah! There goes his precious little nose! <laughs> in, 
Oh, speak roughly to your little boy. You do! And beat him when he sneezes. He only does it to annoy. That too! A big cussy nose, it teases. <laughs> It a bit if you like. Catch! Oh! Oh! Please, I nearly dropped it. I must go and get ready to play croquet with the Queen. Take that, you toad! Oh, missed her again. If I don't take this child away with me, they're sure to kill it in a day or two. I would really be committing murder to leave it behind. <laughs> oh, don't squeal, my dear. That's not at all the proper way of expressing yourself. <laughs> well, if you're going to turn into a pig, my dear, I, I'll have nothing more to do with you. Mind now. Now, what am I going to do when I get this creature home? <laughs> children she knew who might do very well as pigs when she was a little startled to see the Cheshire cat sitting in the bow of a tree a few yards meow, off. Meow, 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 Hello, Cheshire meow. Oh, Would you please tell me which way I ought to go from here? That depends a good deal upon where you want to get to. I don't care where. Oh, and it doesn't matter which way you go. Well, what sort of people live round here? In that direction lives a hatter. And in that direction lives a march hare. Visit either. Both are mad. But I don't want to go among mad people. Oh, you can't help that. We're all mad here. I'm mad. You're mad too. How do you know I'm mad? You must be, or you wouldn't have come here. You play croquet with the Queen today? I should like it very much, but I haven't been invited yet. I'll see you there. Well, you've disappeared into thin air. No, here he comes back. Why the five? What became of the baby? I forgot to ask. It turned into a pig. Who thought it would? Meow. I wonder if he's disappeared for good now. Well, who shall I go to visit? I've seen hatters before, so I imagine the March Hare will be the most interesting. And since this is December, it won't be raving mad, at least not so mad as it was in March. Meow. Did you say p -p pig or fig? Pig. Meow. All right. This time it vanished quite slowly, beginning with the end meow, of the tail and meow, ending with the grin, meow, which remained some time after the rest of it had gone. And so ends the first half of the Columbia Workshop dramatization, Alice in Wonderland. So much of a woman's charm depends on keeping her skin clear, appealingly smooth. Guard your complexion with Lux Toilet Soap, the soap especially made to remove cosmetics thoroughly. Exquisite smooth skin is a priceless treasure. Trust Lux. The Columbia Workshop, under the direction of Bill Robson, presents the second part of its experimental radio version of Lewis Carroll's immortal classic, Alice's Adventures in Wonderland. <laughs> it all started with Alice's curiosity about a white rabbit who hopped by as she and her sister sat by the bank of a stream. Oh dear, oh dear, I shall be late. 
Before she knew it, Alice was falling down what seemed to be a deep well, at the bottom of which, among other curious creatures, she met a mouse. Mine is a long and sad tail. Oh, whoa, is he? And a caterpillar. Keep your temper. Outside a little house in the middle of a wood, she encountered a frog dressed in the livery of a footman. And inside the little house, a sneezing baby, a cook, and a very ugly duchess. Speak roughly to your little boy and bit him when he sneezes. <laughs> She had rescued the sneezing baby from the fury of the cook, only to have the baby turn into a pig. And a moment later, a Cheshire cat had faded into an existence on a limb yeah, above her. In yeah, yeah, yeah. that direction lives a March Hare, and in that direction lives a Hatter. This is either meow, <laughs> both are mad. And now she had not gone much further before she came upon the house of the March Hare. She's sure it is the right house because the chimneys are shaped like ears and the roof is thatched with fur. There was a table set out under a tree in front of the house and the March Hare and the Hatter were having tea at it. A dormouse is sitting between them, fast asleep. The March Hare and the Hatter are using him as a cushion, resting their elbows on him. They aren't at all anxious to have Alice's company. No room. No room. No room. No room. No room. No room. There's plenty of room, and I'm going to sit down. There. Have some wine. I don't see any wine, March Hare. There isn't any. Then it wasn't very civil of you to offer it. Well, it wasn't very civil of you to sit down without being invited. Well, I didn't know it was your table. It's laid out for a great many more than three. Your hair wants cutting. Oh, you should learn not to make personal remarks, Hatter. It's very rude. Why is a raven like a writing desk? Oh, I'm pleased you're going to ask riddles. What fun. And I believe I can guess that one. Do you mean that you think you can find out the answer to it? Exactly so. Then you should say what you mean. I do. At least, at least I mean what I say. That's the same thing, you know. Not the same thing a bit. Well, you might as well say, I see what I eat is the same thing as I eat what I see. You might just as well say that I like what I get is the same thing as I get what I like. You might as well say that I breathe when I sleep is the same thing as I sleep when I breathe. It is the same thing for you, Dormouse. Oh, I must answer that riddle before they forget it. Now let me see. Why is a raven like a writing desk? A raven? Writing desk, raven, writing desk. What day of the month is it? The, um, uh, fourth. Oh. This watch is two days wrong. I told you butter wouldn't suit the works. It was the very best butter. Yes, but some crumbs must have got in as well. You shouldn't have put it in with the bread knife. But it was the very best butter. Hey, let me dip it in. Tea. It, it might wash the crumbs out. Oh, what a funny watch. It tells the day of the month and it doesn't tell what o'clock it is. Why should it? Does your watch tell you what year it is? Of course not, but that's because it stays the same year for such a long time altogether. Which is just the case with mine. I don't quite understand you. Oh, the dormouse is asleep again. Nor I. I think 
you might do something better with the time than wasting it in asking riddles that have no answers. Ah, if you knew time as well as I do, you wouldn't talk about wasting it. It's him. I don't know what you mean. Of course you don't. I dare say you've never even spoken to time. Well, perhaps not. But I know I have to beat time when I learn music. Ah, that accounts for it. He won't stand beating. I know. He and I quarrelled last March just before he, oh, the March Hare, went mad, you know. <laughs> it was at the great concert given by the Queen of Arts and I had to sing. <clears throat> twinkle, twinkle, little bat. How oh, I wonder what you're at. Uh, you know the song, I suppose? I've heard something like it. Uh, it goes on, you know, in this way. <clears throat> Up above the world you fly, like a tea tray in the sky. Twinkle, twinkle, little bat, twinkle, 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 twinkle. Oh, be quiet, old mouse. Stop pitching me. Well, I'd hardly finished the first verse when the Queen bawled out, He's murdering the time off with his head. Oh, how dreadfully savage. And ever since that, he won't do a thing I ask. It's always six o'clock now. Is that the reason so many tea things are put out here? Yes, that's it. It's always tea time and we've no time to wash the things between the whiles. Then you keep moving round, I suppose, from one seat to the next. Exactly so, as the things get used up. But what happens when you come to the beginning again? I'll take some more tea. I've had nothing yet, so I can't take more. You mean you can't take less, and it's very easy to take more than nothing. Well, nobody asks your opinion. Now, who's making personal remarks? Oh, you. Oh, I want a clean cup. Let's move up one place. But then you're the only one who gets a clean place, and I have to sit where the March Hare sat, and he's upset the milk jug into his plate. We move only one seat over. And if you don't like that? But you don't have to drink the tea you haven't had yet. This piece of rudeness was more than Alice could bear. She got up in great disgust and walked off. The Dormouse fell asleep instantly, and neither of the others took the least notice of her going. For they are now trying to shove the Dormouse into the teapot. As Alice wandered on through the woods she came suddenly upon a tree with a little door leading right into it she was not in the least surprised for she had come to expect anything in wonderland so she quickly opened the door and entered to find herself at last among the bright flower beds and the cool fountains of a beautiful garden the one she had seen through the little door in the hall she scarcely had time to look about her when she heard the sounds of a procession approaching. It was the royal entourage of the king and queen of hearts, accompanied by their guests, the kings and queens of diamonds, spades, and clubs with their soldiers and courtiers. When the procession came opposite to Alice, it stopped, and everybody looked at her as the queen of hearts spoke. Who is this? And how did she get in here? Speak, child. What's your name? My name is Alice, so please, Your Majesty. Alice? Alice's <laughs> 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 <Alice's laughs> name? <laughs> Why, they're only a pack of cards. I needn't to be afraid of them. <laughs> she has no business being Alice. Off with her head, off with her... No! Oh, consider, my dear, she's only a child. She has a head, King. Oh, but my, my dear consort. Mind your own. Mm, oh, yes, my dear. On with the procession. 
For the present, child, you may keep your head. Well, that's dreadfully kind of you. The procession continued to the fountains in the center of the garden while Alice looked about her vainly for some way to escape. But the queen kept constantly by her side. Have you seen the mock turtle yet? No, I don't even know what a mock turtle is. It's the thing mock turtle soup is made from. Oh, well, I never saw one or heard of one. Come on then, and he shall tell you his story. After a little walk, the queen and Alice came upon a griffin lying fast asleep in the sun. If you don't know what a griffin is, there's very little use in telling you, for you wouldn't believe it anyway. He's a sort of a half lion, half eagle, half... Um, never mind, I knew you wouldn't believe it. Up, you lazy thing, and take this young lady to see the mock turtle and to hear his story. I must go back and see after some executions I've ordered. Oh, fun! What is fun? Why, she! It's all her fancy, that! They never execute nobody! No how, you know! Come on! They had not gone far before they saw the mock turtle in the distance. Sitting sad and lonely on a little ledge of rock, and as they came nearer, Alice could hear him sighing as if his heart would break. She pitied him deeply. <laughs> oh, what is his sorrow? He's always fancy that. He ain't got no sorrow. You know, oh, this young lady, she wants to know your history, she do. Mm, I'll tell her. Sit down, both of you, and don't speak a word until I've finished. I don't see how he can ever finish if he doesn't begin. Once I was a real turtle. When we were little, we went to school in the sea. The master was an old turtle. We used to call him Tortoise. Well, why did you call him Tortoise if he was a turtle? We called him Tortoise because he taught us. Really? You're very dull. You ought to be ashamed of yourself, asking such a simple question. Do I have an old fella down the old day about it? Mm, yes, yes, we went to school in the sea, though you meant believe it. I never said I didn't. You did? Hold your tongue, little girl. Yes. We had the best of educations. In fact, we went to school every day. Oh, I went to day school too. What did you study? Railing and writhing, of course, to begin with. And then the different branches of arithmetic. Ambition, distraction, oblification, and derision. And what else had you to learn? Well... There was mystery, mystery ancient and modern with geography. Then drawling. The drawling master was an old conga eel that used to come once a week. He taught us drawling, stretching, and fainting in coils. What was that like? Well, I can't show it to you myself. I'm too stiff. And the griffin never learnt it. A long time. I went to the classical master, though. He was an old crab, he was. I never went to him. He taught laughing and grief, they used to say. So he did, so he did. And how many hours a day did you do lessons? Ten hours the first day. Nine the next, and so on. What a curious plan. That's why they're called lessons. Because they lesson from day to day. Then the eleventh day must have been a holiday. Oh, of course it was. But how did you manage on the twelfth? That's enough about the lessons. Tell us something about the games now. Mm, no. Must I really? Yes, you must. Oh, all right. 
You may not have lived much under the sea. Oh, I haven't. And perhaps you were never even introduced to a lobster. Oh, I, I once tasted lo- Oh, no, never, never. So, you can have no idea what a delightful thing a lobster quadrille is. No, indeed. What sort of a dance is it? Why? You first fall into a line along the seashore. No, two lines. Seals, turtles, salmon, and so on. Then, when you've cleared all the jellyfish out of the way... That generally takes some time. You advance twice. Oh, each with a lobster as a partner. Of course. Advance twice, set to partners. Chinese lobsters. Every time I own same order. Then, you know, you throw the, the lobsters as far up to sea as you can. Swim after them. Turn a somersault in the sea. Chinese lobsters again. Back to land again and, well, that's all there is to the first figure. Oh, it must be a very pretty dance. Mm, yes. Would you like to see a little of it? Oh, yes, very much indeed. No. Oh, come. Let's try the first figure, Griffin. We can do it without the lobsters, you know. Which shall sing? Oh, you sing. Oh, I've forgotten the words. So they began solemnly dancing around and around Alice, every now and then treading on her toes when they passed too close, and waving their forepaws to mark the time, while the mock turtles sang. Will you walk a little closer, said the whiting to a snail. There's a porpoise close behind us, and he's treading on my tail. See how eagerly the lobsters and the turtles all advance. They are waiting on the shingle. Will you come and join the dance? Will you, won't you, will you, won't you, will you join the dance? Will you, won't you, will you, will you, will you join the dance? dance to watch. I do so like that curious song about the whiting. But if I'd been he, I'd have said to the porpoise, keep back please, we don't want you with us. They were obliged to have him with them. No wise fish would ever go anywhere without a porpoise. Or well, wouldn't it really? Of course not. Why, if a fish came to me and told me he was going on a journey, I should say, with what purpose? Oh, don't you mean purpose? I mean what I say. Shall we try another figure of the lobster quadrilla? Or would you like the mock turtle to sing us another song? Oh, a song, please, if the mock turtle would be so kind. Mm, no, it can't be the taste. Sing a turtle soup, old fella. Mm, beautiful soup, so rich and green. Waiting in a hot tureen. Let's go off such days. Come on. Come on. What trial? Come on. Come on. And the griffin grabbed Alice by the hand and hurried her off without waiting for the end of the mock turtle's song. By the time Alice and the Griffin had arrived at the courtroom, a great crowd had assembled there. All sorts of little birds and beasts, as well as the whole pack of cards. The knave stood before the horse in chains. The white rabbit, dressed in the livery of a herald, was sat near the throne where the king of the harps was sitting. The king is also the judge, by the way. And as he is wearing his crown over his wig, he does not look at all comfortable and certainly isn't becoming. In the very middle of the court, on a table, was a large dish of tarts. It made Alice hungry to look at them. Oh, look at the tarts over there. Oh, I wish they'd get a trial down and hand down the refreshments. No chance of that. Them tarts is what the trial was all about. What? What a 
the jurors writing on the slates for? They can't have anything to put down yet before the trial's begun. They're writing down their names for fear they forget them before the trial is over. Stupid things. Stupid. Why, they're now all writing stupid things on their slates. Yet look, several of them can't even spell it correctly. <laughs> Silent in the court. Uh, Harold, uh, read the accusation. The Queen of Hearts, she made some tarts all on a summer's day. The Knave of Hearts, he stole those tarts and took them quite away. <laughs> yes, yes. Consider your verdict, jury. No, 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 not, not yet, your majesty. There's a great deal to come before that. Oh. All right then, call the first witness. First witness, the Hatter, sometimes called Mad. Oh, I uh, beg your pardon, Your Majesty, for bringing my tea and bread and butter with me, but uh, I had not quite finished when I was sent for. Well, you ought to have finished. When did you begin? Fourteenth mm, uh, of March, I think it was. Fifteenth. Oh, um, write that down. The jury is writing down all three dates on their slates. Now they add them up. And now they're reducing the answer to shillings and pence. Hmm. Only all the answers are different. Just at this moment, Alice felt a very curious sensation which she recognized at once. She was beginning to grow again. She decided, however, to remain in the courtroom as long as there was room for her. However, the Dormouse, who was sitting next to her, objected at once. <gasps> you wouldn't squeeze so. I can hardly breathe. I can't help it. I'm growing. You have no right to grow here. Don't talk nonsense, you're growing too. Yes, but I grow at a reasonable rate. Not in that ridiculous manner. The Hatter is so nervous under the gaze of the Queen that he shakes himself out of both of his shoes. And in his confusion, he bites a large piece out of his teacup instead of his bread and butter. I'm a... a Poor man, your majesty. You're a very poor speaker, so I may as well have you executed on the spot. <gasps> oh. Ooh, I'd rather finish my tea. Oh, yes, yes, your tea. Well, in that case, you may go. Oh, oh, uh, yes, your majesty, I, I'm going. And just take his head off outside. <laughs> oh, yes, yes, his head. Call the next witness. Alice? What? Me? Yes, you. Well, uh, what do you know about this business, eh? Nothing. Nothing whatever? Nothing whatever. Oh, that's very important. Unimportant, uh, your majesty means, of course. Unimportant, of, of course, I meant. <laughs> Some of the jury writes important and some unimportant, but it doesn't really matter. Silence! I read from the rule book, rule 42, all persons more than a mile high will leave the court. But I'm not a mile high. Oh, yes, you are. Nearly two miles high. See? Well, I shan't go at any rate. Besides, that's not a regular rule. You invented it just now. <laughs> it's the oldest rule in the book. Then it ought to be rule number one. Oh. Consider your verdict. No, no. Th there's more evidence to come yet. Uh, but please, your majesty. Oh? This paper, it's just been picked up. What's in it? I haven't opened it yet, but it seems to be a letter uh, written by the prisoner to, uh, uh, to, to somebody. 
Oh, well, it must have been that. Unless it was written to nobody, which isn't all that usual, you know. Who was it directed to? It isn't directed at all. In fact, there's nothing written on the outside. Uh, it isn't a letter after all. It's a set of verses. Are they in the prisoner's handwriting? No, they're not. Oh, he must have imitated someone else's hand. That proves his guilt off with his head. Yes. It doesn't prove anything of the sort. Why, you don't even know what the verses are about. Oh, uh, read them then. Where shall I begin, not please your majesty? Um, uh, begin anywhere and uh, stop uh, when you like. They told me you had been to her and mentioned me to him. She gave me a good character, but said I could not swim. He sent them word I had not gone. We knew it to be true. If she should push the matter on, what would become of you? I gave her one, they gave him two, you gave us three or more. They all returned from him to you, though they were mine before. Uh, if I should or she should chance to be involved in this affair, he trusts you to set them free exactly as we were. My notion that you had been before, my notion was that you had been before she had this fit, an obstacle that came between him and ourselves and it. Don't let him know she liked him best, for this must ever be a secret, kept from all the rest between yourself and me. Uh, yes, I, I think that's about enough, your majesty. Oh, that's the most important piece of evidence we've heard yet. <laughs> so, uh, now, let the jury consider... Oh, I don't believe there's an atom of meaning in it. Hmm, oh, if there's no meaning in it, Alice, that saves the world of trouble, you know, as we needn't try to find any. And yet, I don't know, I seem to find some meaning here. Hmm, said I could not swim. You can't swim, can you, Knave? Do I look like it? He certainly doesn't, being made entirely of cardboard. Well, all right, so far. Now continue. We know it to be true. That's the jury, of course. If she should push the matter on. Oh, that must be the queen. What would become of you? <laughs> yes, what indeed. I gave her one, they gave him two. Why, that must be what he did with the tarts, you know. But it goes on. They all return from him to you. Oh, well, 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 there they are. And so they are. The tops are on the table. Nothing can be clearer than that, eh? No, then again, hmm, before she had this fit. You never had fits, did you, my dear consort? Never. Off with somebody's head. Anybody's head. Then the words don't fit you. <laughs> That's a fun. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, thank you. Well, let the jury consider their verdict. No, no. Sentence first. Verdict afterwards. Stop it, nonsense. The idea of having the sentence first. Hold your tongue. I won't. Off with her head. But nobody moves. For Alice, who is now her full size and much too large for them to try to do anything about it, jumps into the centre of the court, dumping the jury box and the other occupants of the court onto the courtroom floor. Who cares for you? You're nothing but a pack of cards! At this, the whole pack rose up into the air and came flying down upon her. Ah! Ah! She gave little screams, half of fright, half of anger, and tried to beat them off. <sighs> then she found herself lying on the bank, with her head in the lap of her sister, who was gently brushing some dead leaves that had fluttered down from the trees upon her face. Wake up. Wake up, Alice, dear one. What a long sleep you've had. Oh! Oh, sister, I had such a curious dream, all about uh, a white rabbit and a mo 
mock turtle and a mad hatter and the queen of hearts and a whole pack of cards. And so ends the Columbia Workshop's dramatization of Alice in Wonderland. <laughs> Tune in next week at this same time for another workshop presentation. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System. All right, everyone, that's a wrap. La 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 la